uh, Michael, everybody, can you see the our screen here? Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, terrific. Um, everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our industry conversation titled The Next 10 Years. Uh, my name is Chris Picar. I'm a practice leader with Stantex uh, Upper Midwest Environmental Services team. We've got about 225 environmental professionals uh, ranging from uh, Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio, Kansas, uh, Iowa, uh, Illinois, and a heavy concentration in, um, in Wisconsin. Um, I've recently also served as project manager for the Wood County Solar Project. Uh, Stantec supported Savion through that application process, and we're, of course, uh, really excited that that project was just approved. Um, joined here by uh, Michael Vickerman of Renew, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, and my colleague, Carol McCoy. And so, Carol, uh, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Carol McCoy, also with Stantec, um, Chris's co-practice leader, uh, located <clears throat> in the Milwaukee area. And um, so, background of environmental science, working on wind projects about 10 years ago, and now doing several utility scale solar projects, bumping up towards a thousand megawatts when we get them all permitted. Um, those projects that I'm working on are all over in Michigan uh, for Ranger Power is the client that I'm working for. Uh, excited to be here today and hoping to have some good dialogue and conversation with you all. Thanks, Chris. Great. <clears throat> well, I'll give a little background here. Um, as noted by Commissioner Hebner and others, 2020 has been a landmark year in Wisconsin for renewable energy uh, with the construction of Two Creek Solar Farm and the cumulative approval of over a thousand megawatts of utility scale solar by the Public Service Commission. Now at Stantec, we've been working on renewable energy projects uh, since what I affectionately call wind boom era one. Uh, working on early Wisconsin wind farms, uh, such as Cedar Ridge, Butler Ridge, in, in early, early stages of what's now known as the Quilt Block Wind Farm. I think we were doing bald eagle surveys back on that in, in 2003, if you can believe that. Um, then things got really quiet for a long time in Wisconsin. Um, and so for those of us that you know, have toiled away for the better part of the last decade, the, the recent proliferation of projects, you know, seems almost unimaginable. Um, if you had told me in 2010 that we have a thousand megawatts of solar approved in 2020, I, I'm not sure I'd have believed you. I'd have been excited. I would have assumed it was going to be wind and not solar, and that we'd overcome some of those local opposition issues. Um, but uh, it just, it, we've really just hit a huge breakthrough. So I think it would be really fun if we look ahead to, to 2030. Um, and we're going to focus on utility scale, renewable energy development, and we're curious to know, um, you know, what makes you hopeful, and then maybe what gives you pause for concern? What are some potential uh, challenges we think that we're going to have to overcome collectively um, over the next 10 years to, to get to full, uh, full, fuller scale deployment? So Carol and I, uh, getting ready for this, we came up with several topics. And we're going to try to keep this moving along um, and, and maybe spend five minutes or so on each of the topics. Um, you know, so when you have the floor, uh, it, try to be concise and brief and don't be shy of mentioning something that you heard on a previous session because, you know, this is a virtual conference, of course, so we're all not able to, to attend all the sessions. Uh, so if you heard a great nugget, please, please share that with others. Um, yes. and so just to give you a, a real quick overview in case you're waiting and wondering uh, when uh, one of your, your, your ideas might, uh, what bucket it might be most appropriate, uh, we're going to try to cover solar technology, wind technology, community outreach in relations, um, equity and environmental justice, battery storage, environmental issues, off takers, fuel mix in financing. I know that's, that's pretty ambitious. It's uh, six minutes after. So we'll just spend a, a few minutes on each. And um, I've got some slides here. I will try to take some notes because I think it might be fun to, uh, when we're done, throw all these ideas together, time capsule it. And maybe if somebody remembers in 23, we'll pop it open and see if anybody uh, 
hit the mark on some of these or not. So, um, Chris. Maybe. Yes, Carol. Do you want people to introduce themselves before they share or up to them? Yeah, state your name, uh, you know, who you're with and what you're interested in, and, and then and then then jump in. Um, and so our, our first topic uh, is, is going to be solar technology. Um, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm an environmental scientist like Carol. We work on the permitting side, but of course, you know, we have to be fluent in the engineering. One thing that, that we've all seen is the advancements in the panel technology. Uh, so, you know, I'm seeding it out there, um, you know, what wattage of panels do we think we're going to see in, in, in 2030? Or, you know, they're advancing rapidly. Uh, what, what, what's that going to look like? I assume more than 500 watts, but anybody with any, any input on that, I'd love to hear, hear from you. Any guesses? So the question is, how many watts do you think um, will be in a typical solar panel in 2030? Yeah, yeah. Because um, I have heard that we're up to 500 watts now um, with the uh, um, most recent vintages of uh, our models of uh, solar panels. So um, I'm going to say 700 watts. I think 1,000 would be pretty cool, maybe achievable. Yeah, a thousand was the one that kind of crossed my mind. Uh, you know, recent project I've been on, we've been looking at 410. Another project was looking at 450. But I've also heard about those 500. So um, I have to think a thousand watts, you know, by 2030 uh, is attainable. Um, anybody else have any other ideas on that? I've got a spec sheet in hand from Trina for a 550 right now. I would think thousand is probably attainable in 10 years. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing a project right now. It's 535, 5 degree. 535, mm -hmm. Joanne? Wow. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> Does anybody think we're going to be more than 1,000 watts per panel by 2030? No, but I, I, I have to ask, are all of these panels going to be bifacial? That's a good question. I, I think I would assume so, but uh, again, I'd love anybody else's uh, input or ideas on that. Because I haven't worked on a project not now looking out to buy facial panels in the last year. What about inverters? Any um, any solar engineers on here? Do we see any advancements in inverter technology or anything else like that that might uh, prove a dramatic uh, uh, change to the industry? Or are inverters pretty standardized? More reliability and less cost would be nice. <laughs> I'm hearing about islanding without battery storage coming soon. Yeah, can you elaborate on that? Uh, so um, from everything I've heard from Enphase, they are set to release the IQ8s uh, to, have, to be uh, microinverters that you can put on each panel instead of having them just in their end charge battery system. Wow. When they were talking about it last year already, they're supposed to be releasing it sometime this year. We'll see when. Excellent. <clears throat> cool. Well, uh, I, I could add on to that real quick. I was just talking to a guy from CEQ, I think it is, uh, who distributes um, solar technology. And he said that things were going more and more to the end phase and the microinverter approach. So I'm looking to switch mine over from uh, eventually from the uh, um, uh, power optimizers with uh, the inverters uh, to the micro inverters right to AC. Excellent. Thanks everybody on 
on solar technology. Last call on solar technology predictions. Otherwise, we'll move over to, to wind technology. Chris, what about raising the elevation of the panels to also accommodate <clears throat> agricultural use? Mm -hmm. Do you have any insights there? Have they experienced or are they familiar with any projects where the panels have been elevated such that, um, you know, to allow sheep grazing and to make it a little more attractive from the uh, agricultural perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, MP Systems is offering a single pole and multi-pole mount that's a lot taller and is also, uh, you can pivot it. So you can adjust for different angles throughout the course of the year. It's a little more expensive, but it's a pretty cool technology. Uh, and it looks like it's high enough off the ground that you could like park a car underneath it. Does that affect the, um, the ambient uh, backside energy at all to the plus or minus? You mean from like a bifacial kind of application? Right, yeah. I uh, haven't heard anything from them about that specifically. I would imagine it would really depend on the angle the sun is hitting as in relation to the angle of the panels during at that time of year. You know, the more it glances off, the less you're going to get generation. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Well, thanks for, for solar technology. Let's uh, jump over to, to wind technology. Um, you know, I think here, obviously, the big advancement that we've seen is in the size of the turbines. I know Joanne Carroll, when we started uh, doing these, you know, 750 and then a megawatt uh, turbines were standard. Offshore, the Halide 10 is what, a 13 megawatt uh, turbine. Onshore, I think three megawatts is still uh, relatively standard. Uh, anybody think we're going to hit five megawatts? onshore uh, for each turbine for utility wind by 2030? Definitely. I, I can tell you that um, uh, there's a project under development in Grant County that they're looking at four megawatt wind turbines. Wow. Yeah, and most of that is in the increase in the, in the blade size, isn't hmm. it? Yeah, I think the, the, the rotor length and the, the hub height you know, like 100 meter, and then if we go up to 150 meter, uh, which is, you know, really just, just totally massive. That's, uh, that's a good point, Chris, because um, the FAA has had to, you know, now there's, you know, going before the FAA was special considerations for uh, getting above that 500 foot height, you're right. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at the International Renewable Energy Agency report of 2018, and at that point, uh, the average was 2.6 megawatts uh, for onshore, but they were anticipating between four and five megawatts by 2025. So not even as far out as 2030. Um, and then offshore uh, at, at 2018, it was 9.5 megawatts was, was kind of the threshold and they were anticipating up to 12 megawatts by 2025. So not even needing to wait 10 years, Chris. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. What was and, the uh... and in addition, with these taller hub heights that are associated with the very large rotor sizes, we access better wind resources. So our um, rural sites become windier, more uh, higher capacity factor sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Much more consistent wind throughout the day. And that's great because less turbines needed, which, you know, lowers the impact potential also. That's great. Did, did anybody mention the uh, GE uh, Halide X wind turbine? It's a research yeah. model has been installed in uh, the Netherlands. It's at, rated at 13 megawatts. Mm -hmm. I know I've seen that proposed for offshore. Uh, yeah, it would be offshore. Propose that onshore, uh, but I have to assume if they can build it offshore, they could probably build it onshore, right? Yeah, and right now the the uh, research development model or the prototype is onshore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating that um, it was actually proposed really only as an offshore and not necessarily even as an onshore when 
the beta there transmitter. There are logistical problems in, in trying to build something that large on land. Yep. Uh, it's, Including uh, transporting the blades. Yes. The blades, yeah. So do we think that there's a, a cap on uh, megawatt rating of the onshore turbines by 2030? We're we gonna hit like a dead end just due to pure practicality. Hmm. Well, there may be an economic cap. Um, there is not infinite, infinitely increasing sizes of uh, turbines is not feasible. Um, there is an economic advantage to having extremely large turbines offshore because you require fewer grid connections offshore and those connections are extremely expensive when they're underwater. So I don't, I don't think that inland turbines will ever approach the, the size of offshore turbines. Chris, I had a question I saw uh, come over the line from Don regarding um, wind in the Great Lakes. So maybe there might be some, some thoughts about that. And I guess just to kick us off, um, I was looking into that LEADCO project, um, which you know has been in the works for, I think, at least a decade. And they are rather hoping that there might be a decision made in January here this year by the Ohio Power Siting Board for that uh, icebreaker project. It's a 20.7 megawatt project with six turbines off the coast of... Um, Cleveland. Most of you are probably familiar with the project, but I didn't realize that, uh, you know, a potential decision was pending. Of course, I think they need eight major permits down the road in addition to just the Ohio Siting Board. But um, any, what are thoughts about, about Great Lakes wind, about maybe wind in Lake Michigan or in Lake Superior, as, as Don questioned? Um, I'll add real quick, I grew up in Cleveland and uh, I know Lake Erie's average depth is remarkably shallow. So that's probably why they're looking there. I think average depth of Lake Erie is something like 20 feet, whereas Lake Michigan's 500 or so. So the depth probably will affect that quite a bit. The, the shallow depth of Lake Erie is an advantage in construction, perhaps cost of construction, but it also makes Lake Erie more susceptible to icing during polar vortex episodes and that is not an advantage. Uh, also Lake Erie being a smaller lake uh, may not have as much uh, quality wind resource area as Lake Michigan for instance. So, so are, are a lot of people confident that we might have turbines in Lake Michigan by 2030? I think I remember seeing a few proposals a few years ago and then it got really quiet on that. Well, I, I think the principal barrier is actually of a regulatory nature. Um, there, this, the framework for um, reviewing projects like that, um, figuring out um, appropriate jurisdictions um, to, um, um, to, to make decisions on, on the projects, um, that alone will take at least five years, I think, to, to come up with some kind of um, uh, review uh, framework for reviewing these projects. I think the technology um, questions are more solvable um, and more containable. We're just, this country is just not very good at uh, delegating authority for massive, for reviewing massive infrastructure. Uh -huh. Yeah, Carol, this sounds like a good project for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh Job security, I guess, right? Can I, can I chime in? This is Maria Redmond from the Office of yeah. Sustainability Clean Energy. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, just uh, joined in and hearing about the offshore wind discussion. Um, I have been approached um, by developers uh, who are exploring offshore wind. And some of the issues that Michael Vickerman brought up are, are definitely at the forefront. Um, one recommendation that, that was made was to update the wind on the water study. That was done at the PSC. If you guys aren't familiar with that, um, that there's, you know, that was done a while ago. But that, you know, technology has been um, 
advancing and that there's a, there's a lot of opportunity, but yet there's a lot of definition that needs to happen and, and such. And then the other thing was to track what New York is doing um, as it relates to deployment of and support of, of wind, offshore wind as well. And I think they're exploring wind in the Great Lakes as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I saw that they were looking at, um, I think it was Mitsubishi that was looking into a project um, off of Buffalo in Lake Erie. So I, well, my name is Matt Bohr. I work for uh, Broadwind. We build the towers for uh, for all the, a number of the big OEMs. And uh, I can tell you right now that we're building towers for onshore turbines that are four megawatts and up. Uh, in terms of, you know, we're, we're also located on Lake Michigan, so we keep a pretty tight, uh, Pretty, pretty good uh, kind of eye on what's going to happen out there. And uh, in general, the, the consensus has been that for the public to accept or adopt a lot of the uh, wind in the Great Lakes, turbines should be three to five miles from shore. And the problem is that um, the Great Lakes, with the exception of Erie, simply get really deep, really fast. So unless you're going to adopt some wild technology like a floating wind turbine or something like that, it's just it just doesn't pencil out. That's where we are right now. Obviously, if the, the cost of electricity goes way up or something, you know, that's not necessarily always going to be the case, but that's where we stand today. No, that's good insight. Thanks for that. And, you know, I know that uh, we've got uh, some of our colleagues in California are looking at offshore wind yep. uh, projects there, you know, in the Pacific much deeper, much more quickly than the Atlantic uh, offshore beds. And there they are looking at floating technology. Um, so that would be something if that could get permitted and built in, you know, off California before we could do it here in Wisconsin. Yeah, that's kind of the, the sentiment is that the, the East Coast offshore will happen very, very soon and followed possibly by the West Coast. And then some of that technology might kind of collide into the, the middle of the country. So we'll see, we're hoping for it. Yeah. Cool. Well, great. Um, I wanna... yes, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that someone had, um, Mike Noreen had made a uh, comment about a discussion on disposal, disposal of retired blades um, that I kind of got glossed over here. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. And um, I, I've been looking into this quite a bit because I do a lot of decommissioning plans. And uh, there are really some interesting studies out there um, that, not that it's ever going to be a big profit maker, but um, I've found several studies uh, that are indicating that hopefully by the time most of these large wind farms are um, retired, there will be some options for um, using, the, using them in composites uh, in, in, uh, in other materials for building. Great. Thanks. And I, I appreciate you flagging the comments. I'm, I'm not able to, to, to track those. So so thanks for calling. Oh, Chris, you can always do five things at one time. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I can barely do one well. Um, let's let's jump to uh, community outreach relations, landowner relations. Um, you know, I think that we've seen uh, so far. I'd say pretty strong ex acceptance by the public uh, for these solar projects. Um, I, I know we've got some great people on this call here that have worked in that, um, you know, but one thing that I'm, I've been thinking about um, to, to see this particular conversation a little bit is, you know, pretty soon we're going to be getting to the point where there's going to be a lot of towns and counties accumulating a lot of shared revenue from these developments. You know, you think out in three years when this slate of projects is built, um, you know, it's going to be several millions of dollars each year going to those counties, and that's going to start to add up. And so, you know, how can the renewable energy in, in Wisconsin capitalize on those shared revenue payments uh, that are going to be accumulating and making sure that these towns, counties, everybody knows how much money, you know, is going out every year from these projects to those municipalities um, so that uh, it's front and center in everybody's mind and other towns and counties are really vying for these projects because you know they want that revenue. Um, I, I just don't think we can let that get lost because it's, it's going to start to really add up to a lot of money. So I'd love to hear anybody else's thoughts on how we can capitalize on on that shared revenue payment system. 
Well, um, towns and counties are free to figure out um, what programs that they can support uh, through the shared um, <coughs> formula or whether they want to pass the, um, uh, uh, the increased revenue uh, through the uh, tax base in the form of um, lower uh, per diem, I mean, uh, lower mill rates. Um, that, that, that is an option too. Um, one thing to flag about the um, uh, state shared uh, revenue formula, local aids, is that um, while the towns and counties and villages um, um, reap a, a very significant uh, uh, flow of revenue, uh, the way the uh, uh, statute reads, there's, nothing goes to the school district, um, which is not really a problem with wind power because very little land is taken out of the uh, property tax rolls with the wind farm. But in a, with a solar farm, yes, there is a, a, a effectively a, a, a measurable loss of taxable land. Um, that comes with hosting a, a solar farm, and that could hurt the school districts. Um, so that we may see actually a, a tweaking of uh, the um, uh, utility local aids um, formula to account for that and uh, other potential um, uh, entities that depend on, on tax uh, revenues for um, to stay afloat and stay in business. Yeah. Um Mike, this is uh, Brian Karczewski with Stantec. I'm the uh, regional solar lead here, and I've worked with a number of uh, number of developers that haven't been addressing that that very issue uh, within joint development agreements. Uh, and you know, because it has come up at the local level, um, they are questioning that from a standpoint of the uh, from a standpoint of the shared revenue that 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 is a that's kind of a a hole that needs to be filled and those yes. things. Uh, uh, but what we've been finding, you know, frankly, with some of the projects that we've been working on, mainly in Wisconsin, but also one in Illinois, is that the, the um, how it works out is really not dramatic. Uh, the level of compensation coming from, uh, from these rural or farmed areas. Uh, in the case of uh, like Badger State, um, it amounted to about uh, just a little over $3,000 a year going to, uh, going to the, um, the schools. Um, that's what was being compensated for. So um, I, I can see that, you know, maybe there is a question about this moving forward and something that has to be addressed moving forward. But I think that there does need to be some uh, um, some discussion or at least some investigation as to what we really are talking about with regard to the amounts um, before we start plugging that hole legislatively. Uh, if it's only going to amount to that type of a that type of a um, of a compensation, then it may not really be uh, it may not be worth the angst and the efforts of legislation. Um, uh, but Agreed. Uh, maybe I, um, an industry challenge or an industry focus to say, listen, this is something that as developers and as an industry, we should be doing um, um, as a, just a, a, a voluntary action. As a best practice. Right, right. Just, just a question of clarification. Uh, is there going from soybeans to solar panels, does that really change the property tax rates and revenue that much? Or am I not missing something? No, it, it doesn't change the property tax rate. Um, uh, in fact, that's one of the arguments of some of the locals that it, it should, um, because it's they, they, some folks are questioning whether or not it's an, uh, it's an industrial application. But um, I, it's, it's uh, when you're taking it out and in the state, in, in the case of Wisconsin, you're taking it out of agricultural production um, for an energy facility. And because you are taking it out and doing an energy facility, the, the taxes, the local taxes basically go away and are, that was, that was the impetus 
behind the shared revenue program. Hmm. Well, and Michael, it's Mariah Lynn from Good Steward. All of our clients and all the projects that we're working on for utility scale solar in Wisconsin, all of our development clients are making those school districts whole and even more so right now. And so we are actually using that as a, an additional community relations or outreach um, item to for, for local ex acceptance. And Chris, you started out by saying that everybody wants these in the counties because of the money they provide. Could you please let me know which counties? <laughs> Any county that has your team working, Mariah. No, no. <laughs> we can run it. Yeah, I digress, but. Yeah. No, so Mariah, Mariah, I'm glad that you joined. And, and Mariah um, owns and operates Good Steward Consulting. Um, uh, and so they are a, a PR firm um, that works on behalf of developers. Um, I believe you spoke last year or the year before it renew and you know, we got to work together on the Wood County project. Uh, so Mariah, uh, is, I'd love to hear your perspective as you look out to 2030. Um, what do you see some of the, is the big opportunities, challenges, et cetera, et cetera, in relation to um, local relations and community uh, acceptance? Well, I think it's interesting because what we see in the wind side of our portfolio um, versus what we see in the solar side and the amount of utility scale solar projects right now under development in the Midwest is just booming, as you're all aware. I think 10 years from now, Chris, we're probably going to see some of the fatigue that we see in the wind industry happening um, across our states and uh, across some of the different regions. Um, I'm, I can already tell you, and Chris and I had a, a conversation recently about this. I have several projects that we have in our portfolio right now. I think the, the best thing a county can do if they want this type of revenue is work well, open, um, and, and quickly with the development company because what I'm seeing is a number of places where there's a potential for a second project to be hosted in that county because the county has been accepted or accepting of, of the, the opportunity that's happening and occurring. Um, and because the public's accepting and, and understanding a little bit more about it as well. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but I, that's my one concern is that we're going to get to the point here where you've got the, um, you've just got the public thinking we have too many of them the way that a lot of Iowans are looking at wind turbines more recently, right? There's oversaturation. We've got enough. We don't need any more. Um, so that's the, the one thing. But um, as we continue to pay out what we're paying out, I think counties are going to continue to want to have them. And if you were able to attend, Bob Bishop um, gave some really good points about being a, a hosting landowner in the Badger Hollow Solar Project and, and what we have for Five Acre of Paradise opposition to to solar farms. So we actually, I thought when I took my first solar farm on after being in the wind, <laughs> I thought, well, who doesn't want a solar farm? You know, um, when in all actuality, we actually have a lot of opposition to the use of prime farm ground or row crop production acres, converting that over into energy production where in our industry, we always stood around the fact that you could farm around a wind turbine and, and now we're covering it completely with, with panels. But I think the 10 years coming up are gonna be really good for our industry and for all of us that work within it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, great, glad you could join. Um, uh, let's move along. Carol, you wanna introduce our, our next topic here? Yeah. Environmental justice. Sure, sure. So, um... So this, of course, it ties into climate change too. So I was, I was doing a little reading, preparing for this one and uh, our incoming president uh, cites that people, not projects, are the foundation for addressing an increasingly extreme climate. And so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about connecting workers with uh, the skills, training, and career opportunities that will allow our country to combat climate change. And uh, you know how how the effort there will support and provide more jobs, and and I guess in this COVID economy too help us to recover 
from some of the economic downturn that we've suffered during the pandemic. So uh, just wanted to open it up to thoughts on that. You know, I'll, I'll start it off. I think one of the big areas where we're going to need a lot of a lot of labor is in uh, the urban housing markets, um, and in all buildings. As we need to increase the the efficiency of those buildings, we need to retrofit them with uh, better insulation. All that, which can be very labor intensive. So the building trades that go in and, and change the windows out, for instance, or to put that extra insulation in or to upgrade the furnaces, et cetera, or switch them all over to uh, electric heat and heat pumps, all that has to be done. It's a huge amount of, of labor through our whole building stock. You know, mostly maybe urban, but, but a lot of rural uh, dollars too and, and labor. So it's, it's a huge, huge potential. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and, and one other thing I'm wondering, uh, and I guess I'm, Again, thinking now specifically in relation to these solar farms, I guess, is anybody aware of any conversations between say the Wisconsin Public Service Commission and uh, the Department of Workforce Development? Um, you know, so the PSC could say, hey, look, you know, these uh, constructors are gonna need X hundred number of people to help, you know, physically build these, these projects. You know, what is the training? What are our tech schools doing to prepare uh, for these, you know, ground mounted uh, systems, you know, that are really just, you know, pretty enormous and 12 to 18 month construction operations. So I'd be curious to hear if anybody has any insight on, on any uh, nascent drop job training programs that are occurring across the state and, and, and how widely publicized those are. Because I think that's a great way to get a lot of people back to work. I can tell you that Madison, Area Technical College is already there, Good. Um, and and um, we're fortunate um, here in Dane County to have um, uh, the director of the. Um, I'm not going to spell out the acronym, but the acronym is CREATE, um, and it's housed in um, uh, Madison uh, College. And uh, Ken Walls has been. Um, has been um, developing a curriculum that combines um, uh, uh, solar and other clean energy investments at his at the system level at uh, across all the uh, campuses, um, and at the same time developing um, acquisition strategies or roadmaps, as he calls them, um, to deploy solar, to deploy um, ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps. Um, some people are really, you know, thinking ahead five, 10 years and trying to develop something uh, in the curriculum that translates into hundreds of jobs or thousands of jobs in the next two years. Because mm -hmm. the demand, I look over the, uh, uh, what's in the PSC permitting pipeline and even in front of uh, local governments. And we're talking uh, construction on more than 2,000 megawatts of, of solar in the next three years. Where is the labor going to come from? And, and so it's really important that technical colleges be at the forefront of, uh, of, of training um, people and also to um, approach uh, construction contractors in the state of Wisconsin to participate in, 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 in this uh, rollout. Right now, um, we're seeing um, pretty healthy, uh, well, more projects under the, uh, uh, where the EPC is from out of state, as opposed to one that's in state. And um, that's going to become an issue if we don't see more participation of Wisconsin labor in these, pra in these projects. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, if we've got anybody from Michaels or Bolt or anybody, we'd love to hear from you uh, uh, on, on this. And, you know, are we going to develop a homegrown uh, labor force? You know, when I think about, you know, like with pipeline construction, you've got those pipeliners and they travel, they follow those jobs and they make good money. Um, we're going to have, like Michael said, thousands of megawatts to build. 
uh, but they're not going to have to travel across country. It's going to be county to county and, and, and often from one corner of the county to another cor corner of the county. Um, so the travel isn't going to be quite as severe. Um, and I think it's, it's a huge opportunity and, and, I, and I, I just really desperately hope it's available to all. And, and we're not just pulling in folks from out of state uh, to do the work that we know that folks here in Wisconsin can do. Um, one equity dimension or one factor with equity that I'd like to kind of raise to kind of broaden the thinking and perhaps the conversation, it, jobs are important, jobs are essential. Uh, it's one step or one phase of what the, the renewable energy economy and infrastructure. In other words, for equity to be fully encompassing, we need to find ways that people can consume renewable energy that aren't part of the current consumption base. People can install and afford in some way renewable energy that they can't afford currently because of poverty, because of race, because of redlining, historical. Uh, I think we need to look at ways that we can get not just employees, but people who can be and are employers who are people of color, who are not the usual suspects. And so uh, I just throw that in there to say, okay, if we're talking equity, we're not just take, saying, oh, let's get some jobs for those poor and unemployed people. It's like, how do we address and transform the renewable energy system as part of transforming the entire society and economy? But I mean, that's, we're focusing on renewable energy. So that's where I'm going to direct my challenge. But, but I think we're also focusing on clean energy, and that includes energy efficiency and, uh, and electrification, such as heat pumps. Yep. And those areas really have greater immediate job creation potential in some cases and uh, could benefit from, uh, for instance, a new stimulus package at the federal level. If we could create some funding mechanisms, they could help people at the lower end of the economic ladder with uh, weatherization, energy efficiency, and even heat pumps, um, low interest revolving loans, for instance. Uh, so I think environmental justice is inextricably linked with financing and making mm -hmm. financing available to people that don't have those options right now. I agree with you. I also add that I think uh, community solar is another part of the, the equity um, um, equation, especially when you consider that four out of five residential customers cannot access solar power directly for uh, various reasons. Um, and, and Minnesota has um, blazed a trail to um, make um, community solar available to just about anybody in the state. Um, and it's quite cost effective. And so uh, I think we should explore um, uh, uh, similar policy pathways to develop a, 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 a significant community solar option here in Wisconsin. Yeah, I think Especially that's terrific. Especially considering the brownfield sites that might be available in your community. Can I make a comment to um, through the clean energy planning process, we've engaged um, the Urban League, um, Evie Noir, who spoke at this event uh, on electrification and equity and transportation, um, NAACP, we have a number of groups who have expertise in environmental justice. We'll actually be meeting with these groups um, next Friday to help us define exactly what you're all talking about. Like what is the policy needed um, here in the state to um, hone in on uh, low-income communities, communities of color, frontline communities, and kind of get into the specifics for Wisconsin, because we can all talk about, you know, what we, like community solar, we can all talk about these great things, but what is specific to Wisconsin? Which communities? Um, how many people? Setting goals, like what, what, what are our goals? Like, and, and <laughs> what sectors do they affect? And so I think it's cross-sector, it's you know, helping as many people as, as part of this as we can and, and recognizing that our current system is just not just and we need to do something about it. So we're bringing the people together through our planning process to help us 
you know, analyze the current conditions, um, identify metrics so that we can be specific, and then, and then um, talk about engagement plans. Because we can't just do this and say, we're going to do it. We need to get into the communities, and we need to talk to people, and we need to get people engaged. So I just want to, to throw that in there that this is a major part of the work that we're doing on behalf of the administration. That's fabulous. Uh, <laughs> I think that you just threw the answer out there that uh, we're all hoping for that somebody is on it and they're getting specific uh, and, and they're, they're working hard. Uh, so, so thank you for that. That's, that's terrific and wish you the best on that, that front. Um, oh, in 10 years, what's that, what does that mean? Yeah, that, yeah. What will be in 10 years? How about lower energy, energy bills for everybody? Absolutely. And there's equity across uh, clean energy, right? That everybody gets to realize the benefits of clean energy. Mm -hmm. If I could, I, I, I'm uh, my name again, Phil Smith uh, with Citizens Climate Lobby. And I have to make a brief uh, uh, pitch here for the carbon fee and dividend approach, because all that tax money that we get from uh, taxing fossil fuels, um, the idea of that is to send it back to every single person in this country. And it turns out that the lower 20% uh, of us, economic uh, uh, lowest 20%, get a whole lot more back than the extra cost those policies would cost them. So it's a lot of money, $4,000 for a family of four by the year 2030 on one particular bill. So it's significant and it helps address that equity issue big time. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you all. That was a good, good discussion on that one. Um, we'll keep going. Maybe we can squeak one or two more in. Um, next topic, battery energy storage systems. Um, I caught uh, a little bit of the first keynote uh, speaker. I think uh, Kelly Speaks Blackman. And one thing that jumped out, I thought, please somebody correct me if I heard this wrong. Did she say a hundred gigawatts of battery would be deployed by the by 2030 or 2035 based off ESA's projections? That was a pretty big number that I saw her putting out there. Anybody else catch, hear that? I think it was actually 120 gigawatts. 120 gigawatts. Yeah, well, and I guess, you know, Kind of piggybacking on that, I'm I'm wondering, and I think this is a, a maybe a, a good question for uh, predictions. You know, when do we think we are going to see every renewable energy project paired with battery storage? I know Paris uh, Solar Farm, which was just approved in I think December. Uh, Michael, I'm sure you know. I, I think that had a 50 megawatt battery you know, kind of approved on top of that. Um, but I think that's the first solar project that has been accompanied with a battery storage system. Um, so I'm just wondering, yeah, when we think every solar farm is gonna, gonna come with, you know, batteries attached. And I, I'd love some, some people's thoughts on that. So I'll jump in with a quick one. Um, a lot of the um, proposals and things that I see coming from clients state that um, there may be battery storage involved. <laughs> haven't necessarily seen those come to fruition yet, but just the fact that what we're seeing come out always says there may be battery storage, you know, just kind of tells you the thinking that, you know, that those developers are having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely seems like... Oh, go ahead. Right, Joanne. Um, what we've seen in the CPCN applications are basically placeholders for uh, a battery storage component. But um, in the case of Paris, if Invenergy wants to put um, a, a, a significant battery storage component into that project, they have to go back to the PSC and tell them what they're actually going to do. Chris, I think by in 10 years, every single one of them is going to have it. That's my prediction, 100%. Yeah. I think 10 years for probably sure. Sooner than that, probably sooner than that. Yeah, I'm wondering if five is the number or three is the number or, or even next year, it could be everything that comes through. Uh, I'd say three. Three? 
Three. I guess I'll, I'll just chime in here as a company that, you know, as, a, as an employee that works for a, fundamentally an Australian company for the systems that we design control systems for, for utility scale solar in Australia, they all have batteries. It's, it's the way things are built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to end up here. We just happen to be several years behind the times. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, any other thoughts on batteries or we can, we can move on. Uh, real quick, when I have a, a general question, um, and that is that um, I asked this actually of the, the first presenter on the keynote, uh, what percent by the year 2030 is it going to be battery or some of these other uh, large scale uh, battery or large scale storage, such as gravity storage or compressed air. And she said, uh, I think she said through year 2030, still something like 50 to 75% will be batteries, but then some of these other technologies will start taking over. Mm -hmm. Any other insights or thoughts on that? Liquefied air is, is an interesting technology that we might use in Wisconsin. Um, and I would uh, not be surprised to see that in use by 2030. Mm -hmm. Any yeah, particularly some Go ahead. So, will we see residential solar installations with uh, battery as standard, you know, distributed energy systems? Right now, the solar guys are all telling me batteries are too expensive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it depends on which solar guys you're talking to, Kermit. <laughs> So uh, I can tell you um, Arch Electric um, uh, provides uh, um, numerous storage options along with their standard um, solar offerings, as does uh, Northwind Solar Cooperative. Not every um, uh, solar contractor has a, a, a storage portfolio along with their solar portfolio, but a couple of installers do. Um, Northwind thinks that about 25% of their sales this year will be made up of solar plus storage configurations. Hmm. I talked this to General too. Is that 10? Yeah, this is Mark McDermott from WMEP. I'm gonna take something that Ms. Speaks Bachman referenced and um, put it out in a 2030 context. I have to believe just based on what we see at this point that there will be a robust value chain based on circular economy principles for battery storage by 2030. We'll see the, the movement of resources and materials um, associated with battery as, as a part of not only value creation, but also um, cost impacts for battery storage by 2030 and, and have it be significant. Where exactly that technology will go, I don't know, but it's clearly an opportunity. And from what I know of those that are working in the battery storage area right now, it's front and center for them. That's great to hear. Excellent. Um, and I jump in Chris, with some environmental conversation as environmental scientists, we had to include this topic. So we're just wondering um, from you all, um, you know, concerns that oftentimes come up with uh, landowners uh, or adjacent folks, uh, you know, concerns about, about birds, many of which, I, you know, seem to be a little bit of a carryover in the solar space from the concerns in wind. And I did try and kind of dig into the, the bird question with respect to utility scale solar. And most of the studies that I could find were either in the UK or on the West Coast. I know at present, there's a few studies underway in the Midwest looking at the impact of utility scale solar on uh, migratory birds or, or um, waterfowl. But I wondered, I guess, if, if anybody had any thoughts on that or any other information. Carol, I can jump in, but not on the bird side of the equation. 
So I was incredibly encouraged yesterday with the um, solar land stewardship um, discussion. I have to believe that by 2030, there will be strategies in place that are formally recognized for the positive environmental impacts associated with major solar installations, <clears throat> either in increased groundwater infiltration, increased environmental protections, or um, <clears throat> underutilized lands. Um, I think that, and, and we heard a little bit of that earlier in the discussion today, but I just, I believe that it's likely to turn to the positive side <clears throat> of the equation. Yeah. Solar's been able to do that across the board um, to address issues and being able to meet the NIMBY challenges. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's going to be seen from a positive standpoint, just given some of the things that I heard from TNC and some of the others. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Dave Vetrano talked about what they've done um, in the Cooley region up around La Crosse. And, you know, I experienced that firsthand early in my career. So I, I think on the environmental side, the tides turn to what are the positive aspects associated with large scale installations mm -hmm. that are approached <laughs> from a multi-factor analysis standpoint. I, I missed that Agreed. session. Did they cover uh, you know, the positives associated with pollinator habitat um, you know, as a possibility underneath the panels? Was that covered too? Yep, yeah. pollinators. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and, and within the agricultural community, that's a huge issue because um, the agricultural community is afraid of regulatory intervention for um, mandatory planting of um, pollinator habitat. So, I mean, the dynamics of what large scale um, solar and renewable energy installations can do can have some extremely positive impacts. It's, it's going to take a while for that to develop um, as they, as some of these things um, <clears throat> Are, are brought into implementation. Um, they're talking about wildlife corridors associated with um, some of the larger scale installations. So um, smaller wildlife can go through, but the major, the larger wildlife that causes problems with the installations are managed and they're not subject to as much damage. I just, I think they're the fertile ground that the larger installations provide major environmental issues that are coming is likely to develop over the course of the next 10 years, just based on what I see. That's encouraging. I, um, yeah, I, I was at that solar land stewardship presentation. I was very encouraged by the conversation and the various ideas. And it actually kind of re brings me back to consider the community outreach. Like that's part of the story that I think we need to get out, that there are these incredibly promising and powerful positive land stewardship, groundwater, pollinator habitat, bird habitat benefits. Um, not to mention too, I wanted to ask and, and see if some of these large scale solar installations are taking a, um, advantage of the carbon credit market. So as you switch from farming field to uh, this, this new field of solar panels, you're gonna end up sequestering a lot of carbon that would not have been otherwise, and you can basically sell that carbon sequestering. I yeah, go at market rates around five dollars per per ton metric ton of, of CO two. So, are, is that happening? Are are people taking it advantage is, of that? Yeah, it is happening right now. TNC has been a major leader in that area, um, and just about anywhere that they have the opportunity to build um, carbon sequestration or um, and and then subsequently work on carbon credits, they've been willing to do it. Excellent. One, one other point that uh, I was going to, besides the carbon credits, which is a really good one that, that we need to start taking advantage of, but the other point that we need to stop, start touting uh, from a, a soils background uh, is, the, is the phosphorus loading that we're going to be, that we're going to be uh, offsetting. And that's going to really come into play uh, because a number of these utility scale solar facilities um, are draining to what are 308D uh, impaired waterways. And most of them, most of them, uh, I shouldn't say most of them, pro more, uh, more than 50% of them though, within the state of Wisconsin are listed as 303 impaired waterways because of phosphorus load. So 
Um, I mean, we, we haven't been touting that. Uh, we've been glossing over it within applications by saying that, hey, we're going to be increasing soil tilth, we're gonna be increasing, uh, we're gonna be decreasing erosion, we're gonna be uh, increasing soil structure and infiltration. But uh, um, there is, a, uh, there is a, a calculable thing that we can do using, using programs like SNAP to show how much phosphorus we're attenuating in these fields. Thanks, Brian. I, I was hoping you were going to add that, and, and thanks for bringing up the carbon credits. Uh, I, I love the idea that that you know, no matter what, by 2030, we are going to all be seeing these demonstrated benefits uh, because this is a great land use, um, and and it is going to have a lot of these benefits that you all have just been talking about. And I think that's you're right. I, I think it was Kermit you that said that that um, you know this is going to be part of the community story um, is seeing the benefits uh, to these in addition to the payments. So um, Where, let me just add one other item. I, I think you will see for the solar farms, some discussion on the thermal side of the equation. What's the thermal <laughs> impact associated with the solar farms? Where that'll go by 2030, I've got no clue, but I gotta believe that's gonna be, that's gonna come into the, um, uh, the discussion somewhere along the line. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's something that we've started to see in, in comments from the public and, and, and starting to be broached by the PSC in particular, um, but not, not an ordered requirement uh, for monitoring. Um, so I think that, you know, if we if start to see some, some good on the ground evidence, uh, you know, that's gonna become a real topic of, of exploration. Say, Chris, um, I know we're bumping up against our time, but um, Joanne, maybe you can respond to Don's question in the chat regarding recycling of solar panels <clears> on the potential for that to be an environmental issue moving forward. Sure. Yeah, I did see that too. Thanks for pointing it out. Um, yeah, that's another one that I've been following pretty closely. And, you know, I just see, I see it all over the board. You know, there's certain experts that claim that there will be absolutely no chance that they'll be recycled, but that's that seems to be the, the exception. I think that there's um, a lot of studies out there that are showing uh, that there that will be the chance for recycling and reuse, I think, is going to be huge. Also, an opportunity for people to reuse um, panels and, and acquire them at a really low cost. Um, but real quickly, I guess I would just say that I, I think that anything that has this type of an opportunity is going gonna, is gonna, to um, bring some entrepreneurs forward over the next 15 to 20 years that, um, you know, try to make some yeah. money off. <laughs> well, that's, Envir uh, environmental design, oh, sorry, environmental design is already a part of what the producers are looking at. How do you remanufacture <laughs> what you've placed out there in order to um, continue its, its useful life without a completely new manufactured process? So that's, that's already um, on, the, uh, on the drawing boards. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you tackled that, uh, uh, Don's question there, Joanne. Um, and I, um, I'm glad also that you pointed out um, the potential for reuse of uh, these panels. These are incredibly durable um, uh, pieces of equipment. Um, and they also will be 80% as productive in year 40 as, as they are in, as they would be in year one. So um, it, it just, I can't really throw them out. Uh, throwing something as, as, um, as durable and as productive um, as a solar panel away. Um, I think we'll probably find um, uh, good uses for it as a building material um, uh, in, in some way or furniture. Um, it's it's it, because it's, it's that light and um, it's just gonna hold up over time. Excellent. That was a good one. Um, we're over, but we've still got 36 people hanging on. So I think we just, we power through the last couple topics because, uh, you know, no one's, no one's keeping us here. So um, let's keep going. Next up is, is off takers. Um, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of our Wisconsin utilities purchase uh, these projects and purchase power from these projects. I'm not aware too much of corporate purchasers of independent power projects in Wisconsin, 
And I think we've seen a little movement on some state, county and municipal governments purchasing power uh, from these projects. I don't believe we've seen any federal offtake uh, you know, to run federal uh, systems, right? You know, the, the, the biggest consumer of electricity in the, in the country. And I heard a, a, a good podcast the other day, Energy Gang, Catherine Hamilton. She was a, a, a keynote speaker last year at Renew and uh, they brought up a good point. Like, you know, they could, the feds could literally change the world by, you know, setting up a three person office to off take power and just set up contracts nonstop to buy renewable power. So by 2030, you know, my question is, who do we think is gonna be the balance of the off takers? Is it gonna be utilities, corporate buyers, uh, fed, state, county, or, or is there another mechanism? Uh, Cause right now I'd say in Wisconsin, utilities are in the lead, but you know, that could change by 2030. Chris, could I get a quick definition or clarification of terms? Off takers is, I must confess, something I haven't bumped into as a term. No, of I guess I'm just referring to the, the actual buyers, the consumers of the power, right? So you can okay. have like, you know, Alliant uh, or, or WPS purchasing power from Badger Hollow, you know, through a power purchase agreement. You can have Alliant developing and, you know, sending the, the power out to its, its, um, it's, you know, uh, clients, you know, uh, members of the utility. Uh, so yeah, who's gonna be buying the power? Who's the end consumer? And that's of course, what's really gonna drive it for us. Uh, actually, Chris, uh, um, I, I think we've started seeing it, the, uh, seeing it at the federal level already with the Department of Defense is, is uh, has a lot of RFPs out for for renewable systems uh, as part of their resilience program. So mm -hmm. it's just meeting, you know, that the, the dollar value uh, in what they expect is I think more of the, more of the hurdle. Um, uh, but I think you're, we're seeing it already in the DOD, uh, but your point about the, fa I, I would agree with your point of that. I think the, the one of the major off takers is going to be um, uh, a federal one where we start talking about resilience, and they start talk, and they start looking at meeting resilience needs with renewables. Um, so mm -hmm. that means because I, I think they have to. Their point is they have to get away from the grid, um, mm -hmm. uh, or at least uh, create some redundancy to the grid. So. Uh, I think that you're going to start seeing more and more there, uh, and more and more of the developers trying to meet RFPs from from that perspective. Cool. Any other thoughts on that? Who's going to be buying the power in 2030? Well, Chris, uh, this is uh, Peter Mavis. Uh, apologize, I've been kind of in and out. I had to take a call from a state commissioner that took precedence, but uh, I work for Clean Grid Alliance nonprofit out of the Twin Cities. We represent the large utility scale developers, as Michael knows, him and I work closely together. But, um, you know, with, with, the, with the creation of the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance on the federal level, there's a very large push by the corporate and industrial customers um, as part of their sustainability plans um, to move this direction. So from, from our perspective, um, you know, over the next decade, we, we feel that, you um, you know, the corporate industrial buyers are going to be a huge piece uh, of the off-taker market. Um, it's unclear exactly how big it's going to get, but we think that's going to be a, uh, you know, it's going to be a significant driver, um, you know, you know, for these goods and services. Can I amplify that just a bit? I was about ready to jump in and make a similar point, but let me just add some amplification. From what I'm seeing right now, I would say corporately driven purchases. If the utilities can work out a way to address that, it'll stay at the utility level. But if they can't, the corporations are going to have to find a way to address the carbon issue. I'll give you one very quick example of a large customer requiring the entirety of its supply chain to have in place by 2024 um, science-based targets and requiring 
um, that will that will assure a carbon load that will meet the 1.5 degree goal set in the Paris Accords. So this is the kind of precision that we're starting to see at the business level that's likely to drive purchase decisions. Because for somebody to get, that's a major producer, to get to that 1.5 degree level with current carbon emissions, they've got to do something on the renewable side. It, I mean, unless they quit producing. Um, so there's, there's some major drivers that are likely to be in place. What you'll see by 2030, I believe, is a managed structure of some form that's value driven for the purchase of renewable energy. Great. Uh, excellent couple comments there. Anybody else have something on off takers or if you want to move on? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, this is actually um, right now, um, regulation favors the utility ownership of generation assets. Um, and so there uh, is a, uh, a, a strong economic incentive on the part of uh, uh, utilities to own generation. And um, when they think about um, providing uh, solar service or some other kind of clean energy service to uh, individual customers, um, they want to own that. Um, and as of right now, really, there's only one utility in the state, and that's Madison Gas and Electric, has figured out a way to uh, pass the, uh, to, to flow through uh, a dedicated renewable energy project to an end use customer. Um, and they have uh, two completed projects, solar projects uh, in their territory that serve individual customers and they're building a third as we speak in Fitchburg. Um, but the other utilities have, aren't anywhere near where Madison Gas and Electric is. And if they're, uh, if these customers really are, um, uh, genuinely committed to uh, carbon reductions, they're going to have to come up with some other workaround uh, to, um, to compensate for the fact that the, the um, sleeve tariffs that you have with mg &E just aren't available in other, in, in other parts of the state. That's a constraint. We, and it'll take some kind of policy change to um, open things up for all companies around the state. If the utilities can't find out a way, if the utilities can't find a way to deliver green electrons, corporations will find a way to purchase and buy them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Simple. If necessary, by purchasing and buying portions of the legislature to accomplish it. Let's hope they don't have to go that far. <laughs> Excellent. All right, that was another good discussion. Um, uh, I think next up is, is fuel mix here. Uh, Carol, you want to introduce this one or you want me to introduce her? Carol might have left us. Well, we can keep this one short. Uh, Michael, you probably know off the top of your head what Wisconsin's uh, current fuel mix composition is for you know, our, I think it's, what are we, 14 gigawatts-ish power uh, for years, our, our base load here. Uh, you know, so I'm dying to know, you know, 2030, what's that fuel mix going to look like? Are we going to hit 25% renewables, you know, and trying, trying to balance across our utilities? We're we going to hit 25% or 50%? I would say that um, we'd be doing well to have 10% of our electricity coming from um, solar generated in Wisconsin. We can get there. Um, there are limits to what the uh, um, a public service commission can review with its present uh, with present staffing levels. Same is true with uh, local governments. Um, the big variable here, and I, I really don't know how to uh, 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 make any kind of estimate, is what can be accessed uh, through the trans the regional transmission system from other states. Um, it could be a large number. It could be a small number. I just don't know, but um, I am more confident about um, uh, solar constituting possibly 10% of the, of the generation mix by 2030. So a question for you, do you see um, MISO having a 
renewable component as a part of their distribution system by 2030? I, um, I wish we don't really follow MISO all that closely at Renew. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really in a position to answer your question, but I knew, I, I do think that uh, some of the uh, MISO um, decisions planning for new transmission infrastructure and um, uh, different kinds of pricing could make a, and, and also pricing that allows um, um, uh, easier entry by um, storage um, to that could that could really um, change the uh, 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 resource mix dramatically. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody have any other opinions on uh, what we think our field? Chris, if I could, real quick. I mean, with the FERC order twenty two twenty two that directs the RTOs to do the aggregation of DERs. Um, you know, that's going to take years to figure that out, but we'll get to a point where you have a bunch of distributed resources be able to aggregate and bid into the MISO market. It's way beyond my knowledge of things, but I do anticipate that that will, um, we'll see significant growth there over the next decade. Yeah, that would be, that would be terrific. That'd be excellent. I'd like to just uh, pipe in and, and uh, give a prediction that it uh, it's going to have to be much more substantial than 10%. It's going to have to be 50% or more. I mean, yeah, yeah, we can't I get to our, our, our goals if we don't. And so but the Biden administration, whether it's carbon uh, fee and dividend approach, but taxing fossil fuels, whatever else they come up with, it's got to happen. And I think we should be ready to greatly accelerate renewables. And it'll uh, hopefully it'll be market driven, and and the prices for the fossil fuels will just have to, have to be so expensive that everybody's going to start switching. And, and offshore wind could be a big part of that picture. I think uh, there's been a lot of caution on that score, but I think that is a real potential large growth area by 2030. Right on. Okay, well, uh, I think we got one more topic, and I'll be honest, this is an area that I am uh, the least familiar with, uh, personally, um, is, is the financing, and I'm just, we've, we've got a lot of smart people on this call. Is anybody aware of Chris, any- Chris, sorry, I have to jump in. Te the tech um, staff just uh, noted that they were going to kick you off in one minute. But <laughs> <laughs> I'd let you know. <laughs> I guess we only got a 20 minute uh, uh, on there. Well, anyways, <laughs> we'll wrap it up. So thanks everybody. This is just a great call. Uh, I wish uh, we could have done this live to have seen each other in person, uh, but, but great fun and, and great to hear everybody's insights. So thank you so much for joining and, and Michael, thanks for hosting us. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Wonderful conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Chris, and thanks all. So long. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Carol, Joanne, everybody else. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all.